Hi everyone, welcome to or welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me again. Today we are talking about a serial killer named Rodney Alcala. Last time we spoke about Angus Sinclair, he was one of Scotland's serial killers. So if you haven't seen that, I will link it somewhere up here for you. But without any more rambling, if you would like to see how I got this look, or you're just here to hear about Rodney Alcala, then let's get into it. So Rodney Alcala was born on the 23rd of August, 1943 in san antonio texas he had two sisters and his mom's name was anna and his dad's name was raul and rodney was around eight years old his whole family moved and went to mexico but just after they got to mexico his dad then decided to kind of like leave and he completely abandoned the family in mexico and obviously now anna rodney's mom was left all alone so she took her children back to america and they eventually ended up living in los angeles Nothing much was said between the time that Rodney uh, moved to Los Angeles and when he was around 17. So there was quite a big gap from 8 to 17 that I couldn't really find much information on. But at the age of 17, Rodney then enlisted in the army where he was a clerk. And not much really happened there, but in 1964, he was discharged on medical grounds because a psychiatrist in the army at the time, they diagnosed him as having antisocial personality disorder. And Rodney did go to college. He enrolled in California State University, but he later enrolled at UCLA. But in 1968, Rodney did end up graduating with a fine arts degree. And Rodney himself claims to have a genius IQ level. And because of this genius IQ level, he also went to the University of New York. But when Rodney attended the University of New York, he didn't go as Rodney. He actually went as an alias and his name was John Berger. And apparently while studying film in the University of New York, he studied under Roman Polanski. Rodney committed his first documented crime in 1968. So according to this witness who was driving by at the time, he saw Rodney lure an eight-year-old girl into his Hollywood apartment. And obviously when he saw this, he called the police. The young girl, her name was Tally or Tali Shapiro, and she had been beaten and sexually assaulted by Rodney. But by the time that police actually got into the, his Hollywood apartment, unfortunately he had already fled and he escaped to the east coast of America. And while Rodney was hiding out in the east coast, during the summer months, he enrolled as a camp counselor at the New Hampshire Arts Camp for Children. But when Rodney went to work at this New Hampshire camp, he didn't use his name Rodney, he used the name John Berger, remember him. And in 1971, Rodney was listed on the FBI's most wanted list. And obviously him being on the FBI's most wanted list, he was seen like his face was spread across America. And two of the girls who he was counseling at the New Hampshire camp, they noticed him and they were like, this guy looks really like my camp counselor, except my camp counselor's name is John Berger and this guy's name is Rodney Alcala. But luckily these two girls did notify the other camp counselors and they then notified the directors of the camp and the directors got in touch with the FBI or the people on the one most wanted and Rodney was extradited back to California. And by the time Rodney had been extradited back to California, Tali and her family had moved to Mexico to try and get away from it all. So when Rodney actually had his trial, Tali and her parents, like they refused to let her come back to America to testify. So they were unable to convict him of sexual assault and attempted murder. So they kind of had to lessen his charge, unfortunately, because they were obviously without their primary witness now. And in 1974, Rodney was paroled and let out of prison after only serving 34 months behind bars because he showed signs of rehabilitation. And you guys know how much this irritates me because just like in the Moses Satole case that I did, like I'll link it somewhere up here, but he was let out and so was Rodney. And they always want to say that the prisoners are rehabilitated. But like I say all the time, when a murderer or a serial rapist or anyone is put in prison and then show sign of rehabilitation is because in my mind, you know, this is just my opinion, because what triggers them to do what they did on the outside is not in prison. Like if you have young girls, that is what is triggering maybe Rodney or I don't know, they're not in the same prison as him. So obviously he's a model citizen because what's triggering him is not there. Get what I'm saying? 
that's my TED talk for the day. But less than two months after Rodney was released, he was sent back to prison for violating his parole because he had given marijuana to a 13-year-old girl. And the 13-year-old girl that he gave marijuana to also said that he actually kidnapped her and that's why he was sent back to prison. And once again, he was released and, well, sent out on parole only after serving two years in prison. And in 1977, even though he had a criminal record and he was listed as a sexual offender, he was hired as a typesetter by the Los Angeles Times. Funny enough, he actually assisted in the coverage of the Hillside Strangler murders. And while Rodney was working on the Hillside Strangler murders for the Los Angeles Times, he was actually questioned by police because they looked at his background and they looked at who he was like kidnapping and attempted murder and they interviewed him as a suspect for the Hillside Strangler murders. They eventually found another serial killer who was linked to it so they let him go, not realizing that he was a serial killer in his own right. In 1977, a lady named Ellen Hoover, who was 23 at the time, she disappeared on July 15, 1977. And when police went to her apartment to try and find some clues, uh, like where she went or did she leave anything, they actually looked at her calendar and for July 15th, the date that she disappeared, she said that she was going to meet a man named John Berger. And in 1978, Rodney actually appeared on a dating show where men and women were interviewed by their prospective dates. And basically there were like three men or three women that were on stage, but they were all hidden. So the person like asking them questions, they couldn't see who they were or what they looked like, but the audience could see what they looked like. And Rodney was bachelor number one. And remember, Rodney was a convicted criminal as well as a sex offender. But obviously the show didn't look up any details or any background checks on anyone. And there were three men on stage when Rodney went on the game show. He was one of three. And the lady who was one of the prospective daters for one of these men was named Cheryl Bradshaw. And she asked him, if you had to be a meal, what meal would you be? Describe it. And he answered, quote, I'm called the banana. And I look really good. Peel me. End quote. Because I've tried to say this with a straight face. Even when I researched this, I couldn't, I, I can't. It's... At the end, Rodney used his charm and this banana innuendo. And he won the date with Cheryl. However, when Cheryl and Rodney met face to face, she said that she felt really uncomfortable because he was really creepy. So she ended up actually not going on a date with him. Clever, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to the dating game. And we'll get right underway. It's time to meet our first three eligible bachelors for game number one. And here they are. Good luck, gentlemen. Well, let's see. Bachelor number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. And it's time to meet our young lady for game number one. And here she is. Here is a young lady with a wealth of experience. She once earned a living massaging feet, but she quit when her boss suggested that she work her way up. Then she taught school in Phoenix, Arizona. And now she's here to educate our three bachelors in the art of amour. Welcome, if you will, sensational Cheryl Bradshaw. Hello, Cheryl. Bachelor number one. Yes? What's your best time? The best time is at night. Night time. Why do you say that? Because that's the only time there is. The only time? What's wrong with uh, morning, afternoon? Well, they're okay, but night time's when it really gets good. Then you're really ready. I'm a drama teacher, and I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one. You're a dirty old man. Take it. Oh, come on, over here. <sighs> <sighs> Number one, 
I am serving you for dinner. Oh. <laughs> what are you called and what do you look like? I'm called the banana and I look really good. Uh, can you be a little more descriptive? <laughs> Peel me. <laughs> Welcome back to the dating game, and Cheryl, we have reached the moment of truth, as we call it. You heard from the bachelors, you got some great dramatic presentations, some good answers, but now I'm going to ask you a question. Will that date be bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three? Who gets the dates? Well, I like bananas, so I'll take one. Number one, bachelor number one, all right. Well, there they go. Congratulations, Rod. You did it with the one answer. Well, as far as I can see, Cheryl and Rodney, it looks like the two of you may be involved in some sort of racket. So we're going to have you take to the court. Oh, first. Then in 1979, a 12-year-old girl from Huntington Beach in California disappeared somewhere between the beach and where she had ballet that day. And this was on June 20th, 1979. Unfortunately, her body was found around 12 days later, and this was in the foothills of Los Angeles. But I'm not sure how police got to this, but the earrings of the missing 12-year-old girl was actually found in Rodney's locker, which ended up him being arrested, and this was in July of 1979, so a month or so after her body had been found. Sorry, I did forget to mention that the 12-year-old girl who was found to be murdered by Rodney, her name was Robin. And in 1980, he was tried and convicted of the murder of Robin. But his conviction was overturned because the jury that convicted him were exposed to Tali Shapiro's um, sexual assault and murder, attempted murder, and the other assaults and kidnappings that Rodney had done. So this may have seemed to be an unfair trial because they may have like unfairly persuaded them and convicted him based on that. And for the first time he was tried and convicted, he was sentenced to death, but obviously that was overturned. And then in 1986, he was tried and convicted again, and also sentenced to death. But it was overturned again because the appeals court, they had a witness who reported that the ranger who had found Robin's body was, quote, hypnotized by police investigators, end quote. While the prosecution was preparing for the third trial in 2003, Orange County investigators found that Rodney's DNA matched semen that was found on two murder victims that were back in Los Angeles. And another pair of earrings was found in Rodney's locker that matched one of these two ladies that they found his semen on. And additional evidence, including DNA, that matched a cold case back in 2004, led to Rodney being accused to the murders of four additional women. The first was named Jill Barcombe, and she was 18 at the time. She was killed in 1977. And they, the police first thought that she was a murder victim of the Hillside Strangle murders. Do you remember me talking about that? The thing he was reporting on. The second one of the four victims was Georgia Wickstead, who was 27 at the time and she was murdered in her Malibu apartment in 1977. The third of the four victims was named Charlotte Lamb, and she was 31 at the time, and she was killed and strangled in Al Segundo in 1978. And the fourth of the four victims, her name was Jill Parentiu, and she was 21 at the time, and she was also murdered in her apartment in 1979. And in 2009, Rodney stood trial again. And in his third trial, Rodney actually stood as his own attorney to defend himself. And he told the jurors that at the time of Robin's murder, he was at Knott's Berry Farm, so he couldn't have murdered her. And interestingly enough, for the four other cases that was mentioned just earlier, he didn't defend himself at all. And Rodney was convicted of all five of the murders. And interestingly enough, one of the witnesses who attended his third trial was actually Tali Shapiro, remember his first victim? And in March 2010, Rodney was convicted and sentenced to death for the third time. Rodney had actually been in prison since he was sentenced the first time for Robin's murder. And he filed two different lawsuits against the California penal system. For one, a slip and fall claim 
and two, because the state had failed to provide him a low-fat diet. I do find it interesting that New York officials have had the option of filing additional cases against Rodney, who is the main suspect of another two murders. Remember I spoke about a lady named Ellen Hoover who went missing in 19, I think it was 77, and she had that calendar name for John Berger that she was meeting on the 15th of July. He was a suspect in, in her disappearance and her murder because at the time he was working as a security guard in New York where Ellen lived and he was also a suspect in the murder of a flight attendant who was named Cornelia Crilly and this occurred in 1971 while Rodney went to New York University and Rodney still maintains his innocence for all of the other murders that happened and he's still currently on death row at San Quentin State Prison and in April 2010, the Huntington Beach Police Department made public 120 photos that were found in Rodney's possession because back in the day, he would lie to people and say that he was a photographer and these were some of the photos that they found. And they released these photos in the hope that they could identify some of the people and they were also worried that the people who weren't being identified were more victims of Rodney. But luckily, some women have come forward. So since they first released the photographs, 20 women have come forward, but I will link the number of the police that you can contact if you have seen any of these photos or know of any of the women and the link that you can find the photos. But that is all I have for you on this case today. This, I think this is a better well-known or a more well-known case, and I hope that you enjoyed it. There are quite a few details of that, ha that happened to the victims, but I don't really feel like I don't really want to share what happened to the children. So if you want to read up, you can do that by yourself. But other than that, I always have fun with you. So thank you for joining me today. And I hope that you're staying safe. Please let me know what you think of the story down in the comments below. And I hope to see you again next time. Bye.